Okay, everyone. It is... It's already 19 people in here. That is spectacular. Um, hello, everyone. It is the Unfound live show for May 20th, 2020. So it's 520-2020. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, I took a shower. My hair is a little bit wet, but everything's looking good here. I'm feeling good. It's been uh, a beautiful uh, day beautiful uh couple last days i mean the last four or five days probably have been uh, spectacular here beautiful uh but unfortunately i haven't been out in it much because why doing unfound work got to get stuff done so um but it's been some beautiful views uh the, i've been working out at night by climbing the stairs in my building here, I live in a condo building that's 18 floors, so I climb the stairs, and then I lift some weights with dumbbells and push-ups and things out on the landing by the elevator, which is technically outside, and it's just perfect weather at night uh, to work out out there. It's just beautiful. So I hope everything is beautiful where all of you are. Hello, Angela. Hello, Christine. Joyce. How are you doing? Uh, we haven't talked in a couple of weeks. I'm hoping that your uh, husband is doing well, Joyce. Susan, Laura, James. Hello, Heather. What's up, Heather? LaFord, Jasmine, Nicole, Bookkeeper. Oh, that's who you are. Okay, now I know who Bookkeeper is. Good, okay. I recognize you, uh, Bookkeeper. Blaze, Paula. Paula says they got golf size hail. Oh my gosh. Okay. Angela and Coco. Coco, I, you must be new. I don't rec. I don't. I'm pretty good at remembering people's names who show up uh, in these live shows. I don't know what that is. But Coco, uh, I'm thinking maybe you are possibly new to the live show and welcome. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Ann. Full Metal, what's going on? Sharon. Glad everybody's getting in tonight. Please remember, as you are, the easiest thing to do is as soon as you get into the start watching, uh, just go there and click uh, the like button for uh, the show tonight. That's the easiest way to do it. I mean, I know that you're supposed to not give it a thumbs up or a like unless the show's really good, but you know what you get here on Wednesday nights. You know it's always high quality material. <laughs> you know I always come here with a real good agenda, and we end up uh, talking for quite a while back and forth. Um, I think last week we went like an hour and forty five minutes, and we may just go that long tonight. We'll just have to see. Uh, Coco says I usually just listen in. Oh, okay, Coco. Well, thanks for typing in tonight. Thanks for typing in. I'm guessing that uh, Cherie is going to show up at some point. Let me maybe, uh, uh, she has forgotten that uh, we're doing the live show. That happens sometimes. Let me see. Hold on a second. Let me. And, um, hello, Sherlock. Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, she's here. I think you think Heather. Okay. Sure. just haven't seen her, uh, type in yet. Thank you for all the thumbs up. But yeah, it's, it's been good here. Um, oh, there you are. There you are. Sure. Thank you. Sure. I uh, hope you're doing well today too. Um, but very busy here. Uh, worked on almost the entirety of Friday's episode today between, um, I typed it actually out my part of it yesterday and then recorded all of it today. Also, uh, edited the interview. And when I say edit, that means go in and check the audio levels and, uh, check if there are any mistakes and things like there was a, a break that we had to take during this interview that I had to cut out of it. So that's some of the things that I have to do when I go in and edit, uh, an interview and it came out really well. So the hello, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Yes, I will be mentioning the super chat here in a moment. Um, so I was getting most of that done. I would say Friday's episode is about 95% done. 
And this episode for this Friday, uh, as some of you already know, is a unique one. And I've been waiting a long time to have this guy on the program. And he was excited to do the interview this past Saturday. And I will talk about that later in the program. If you see uh, Angela here with this little, I don't know, is that like a genie or something? Uh, serving some coffee or something like that, Angela? Is that what that is? Uh, that is what is known as the Super Chat. If you would like uh, a comment to get some uh, bigger attention than it normally gets just by typing it in there, if you would like to monetarily contribute it to the program, uh, that is one way to do it by using the Super Chat. Just look for the dollar sign button and you can type... Uh, that in there and I would appreciate it. And that goes to all the things that of course that unfound does just like uh, at Patreon. And maybe I should mention that. And we're going to be talking about Patreon um, a little bit here in a moment, but patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. And Angela, thank you once again for enabling the super chat. As I typed not long before I started this show, I still didn't really get any questions today. Maybe people aren't in a questioning mood. At least I didn't see any. So if you have any questions that you'd like me to answer, whether on true crime, missing persons cases, or something regarding something else, something else that's going on, or some nagging question you have about me, the program, anything going on, I'll be happy to answer it as long as it's PG and it's not too personal. But I am going to be talking about, before you start asking me about maybe some of these disappearances that have gotten national attention, for example, Madison Bell, and then there's this uh, woman who disappeared in Colorado, I guess about a week and a half ago. I am going to be talking about both of those disappearances tonight before we are done. That is on the agenda. Hello, Deborah. Hello, Miranda. Miranda is a, a new think tank member. Thank you, Miranda, for your contributions to Unfound. Deeply appreciate it. Paula asks me, if you had to have a regular nine to five job, what would it be? I don't know, Paula. I really don't know. I've had all sorts of, as, uh, as I have uh, talked about my employment past, uh, my past employment, I have a lot of different kinds of jobs. Uh, I'm good at jobs where I can work by myself and I work at a job. I'm probably good at be good at jobs where uh, I'm not given a lot. I'm given a lot of latitude on how to figure things out. Maybe a good example, a returning think tank member. I apologize, Miranda, a returning think tank member. Thank you. Um, I would give an example, Paul, of a job that I thought I was pretty good at was one that I mentioned when I was a printer and fax technician, and I also delivered toner and moved equipment and set up networks and things like that. I really didn't mind that job too much. I liked it. There was a lot of autonomy. I did a lot of driving. I, I went uh, down to Kingman, Arizona. Drove the whole way down to Phoenix, up into Utah, down to LA, down to San Diego, working on printers and faxes that weren't working correctly. And I have to tell you, I kind of liked that job. Uh, when I started not liking it, when it was when we became a glorified moving company, when uh, some of these offices started moving around and we were doing, I was doing less working on machines and more moving machines and things, and I really didn't care for that. But as long as I was working on things and tinkering and trying to figure out my own schedule on how to get all the work done efficiently, I was pretty good at that job. And, and I would not say that I, I minded it that much at all. I you know, could eat where I wanted. I was driving somebody else's, I uh, was driving a company van. So probably some job like that. I, I, of course, it didn't pay that well. But something along those lines goes well with my mind and what I think I'm good at. 
Now, as far as high paying, like high paying, high paying jobs, I, I'd really, 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 really have to think about that. Um, so there you go. That's something from my past of a job. And I, of course, wor liked working on the, the shows that I did, the Magic Show and the Rat Pack Show, but those are not usual nine to five jobs. Uh, bookkeeper asked me, how many people are in a typical think tank discussion? That Bookkeeper, that's a good question. Uh, maybe between nine and 12 people. Something like that. Nine is usually the low end. 12 is probably the high end. And that makes for a really good discussion where everybody's ideas get heard and, and, and people can talk to each other in a little bit more easier fashion than we can in this live show, which is, has a lot more people. Um, Je Jefferson City, Missouri, Lola. L-L-L-O-L-A, Lola. Uh, Paula says, I think you would, I would make a good college professor. Well, I would love to do that and talking about missing persons cases and educating people. And that's something we're working toward Paula for sure. Uh, I would certainly uh, enjoy that. I, I agree with you as long as I would get to pick the topics, but, um, and, you know, I, I, once again, though, I think about, is that a regular nine to five job? My, pr my impression of professors it's kind of like they teach like nine classes five days a week, and then they have assistants who teach classes for them and things. So maybe it is a regular nine to five job. And I'm not saying being a college professor is easy. It just wouldn't occur to me to call that a nine to five job, but it's certainly work. It's certainly important. And uh, I'm happy that there are professors out there. And I would certainly love the opportunity to do that in talking to criminal justice majors about everything regarding missing persons cases for sure. And like I said, uh, it's something that I've been talking about for a while. Sure. He's not posting patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. Um, the sleeper poll, Danielle sleeper from this past Friday. I asked all of you the question, at least if you are in the discussion group, whether what you thought about the reason that why was it that Austin didn't just say if he is responsible for Daniel's disappearance, why didn't he just say I got up and she was gone, which is a popular statement in disappearances like Danielle's. Uh, of course, Christy Nichols from just like six weeks ago, five, four weeks ago. We covered the disappearance of Rosemary Rapp and a few others where their husbands or, or boyfriends just say, I don't know. We got up the next day and she was gone. And we don't tend to believe that. Why didn't Austin do that? And uh, a, a majority of you believe that the reason he did that was because he just wasn't thinking ahead enough. I even put in there just because Austin was dumb. I also gave the choice is the reason he said that because somebody might be able to prove that he wasn't sleeping that night, and that got some that got some uh, attention as well. But the number one choice was just didn't think that Austin was thinking ahead very much to say something like that. Now, what is interesting is in the in the think tank, being that a bookkeeper just asked about that. In the think tank, uh, a couple people came up with uh, an idea that is very counterintuitive but uh, maybe kind of works. And their argument was the reason he didn't say that he just woke up and she was gone is because he didn't think people would believe that, <laughs> which it seems so simple, but it might be true. And he thought that, well, if I say that she went missing while I'm out with my buddies, then I have an alibi. If I say that I was asleep and she went missing the next morning. I got up and she was gone. Well, I'm just not sure people are going to believe that. So I'll come up with something else, which is interesting. And I have to admit, it's so simple, but it certainly could be true. That he just didn't use that reason because he thought nobody would believe it, which is kind of, like I said, it's counterintuitive. But I think the people who brought this up in the think tank on Sunday night uh, have a point. And if you want an, a good idea of how the think tank works, that's it. We do sometimes come up with ideas 
that uh, maybe people haven't thought before, and that's why we call it a think tank. We sit, we talk, we think about these things, and we bounce ideas off of each other. And my job in the think tank is to kind of um, challenge people on their ideas. We don't disagree. We discuss. We don't argue. We just hear each other's ideas. And when somebody voices an idea, sometimes I just ask, well, you know, maybe you need to expound on that uh, a little bit more. And that's what we do in the think tank. And we'll, of course, be doing that again this Sunday evening. Let's see what some of uh, you said. Joyce, when is my dad coming back down? I'm not sure about that, Joyce, given everything that's going on uh, right now. So I just don't know. Does that mean I will cut my hair? The answer is no. Uh, no, I won't. <laughs> and it'll. And that's just the way it is. But that's a good, that's a solid question, though, Joyce. Uh, Carrie says, hi, I'm from the area of the Missouri State Fair City. Welcome. Hello, Carrie. Yeah, Heather's laughing at Joyce for good reason. Um, Carrie, I think so he can semi-distance himself by being not home. Right, regarding uh, Austin. Yes, Carrie. Miranda, he's probably not that smart enough to think uh, think of saying that. There very well could be, Miranda. That's why you know we threw around a lot of different ideas regarding that. But some people did come up with that idea, and I, I thought it was kind of a new idea. But uh, in, at least in the group, with the poll that I post every week regarding a disappearance, the choice was that Austin, the reason he picked what he did was, what, the reason he said what he said is he just didn't think ahead enough. Because in looking at his statement that he left, she disappeared, and then when he came back, you know, she was gone. There are certainly holes there. There's no denying that. They are just circumstantial holes, but there are holes. Sheree, I think the idea assumes he follows disappearances like we do, therefore I reject the idea. Yeah, well, it's, you know, maybe that could be Sharice. Maybe we're too smart for our own good sometimes. True. Lynn, hello. Do you have any pets around during your podcast? Lynn, I don't have any pets, period. I love animals. In fact, uh, I will tell you, like when I'm on Instagram doing stuff for Unfound, like I posted uh, some pictures today in, in the story section of Unfound, of Instagram for Unfound, I love to go on there and watch like those otter videos, you know, they're making those little squeaks and things, and I love watching funny dog videos. I'm serious. I just don't have the patient, patience to take, take care of another living thing. I just don't have the patience. And I'm not allowed to have pets in this condo anyway. But I, I I love animals and I don't mind babysitting and things, but taking care of them on a daily basis and everything. That's just not me. Love them though. Uh Lynn, I uh, I'm not gonna answer the question about we'll solve one unfound case. I'm not gonna put one above uh any other. I can't do that. Uh Paula says we can get you a pet for your birthday. Don't do that, Paula. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, Heather says, no, I don't want an otter. Uh, Stacy, will I be at Crime Con in October? No. In fact, I'm not even sure that Crime Con will happen, Stacy. So I don't know. And even if it were, that's not the type of thing that I would go to anyway. And I'm not getting into that in the show tonight. Um, Kristen said, I thought he said she went missing because the son may say something. Figure he left her on the couch. And then Sun saw her in the morning when they left. Then he came back and did something with her. Maybe, Kristen. Maybe. That could be. Okay. So that was the poll. Just the majority of people thought that the reason he didn't give the I got up and she was gone scenario is because he just didn't think uh, ahead. Let's move on to this. Uh, I'm sure you've also seen that the remains that were found on Dennis Bowman's property in Michigan uh, back towards the end of last year uh, have been identified as Andrea Bowman's. And uh, that's no surprise, I, I think, to anybody. And he will he has been charged with Andrea's death. Of course, he is also facing charges for the murder he allegedly committed in Virginia. 
We at Unfound continue to believe that he is a serial killer. Uh, we believe that he has killed multiple women. And I would not put it past him that he might have killed some other girls as well. If he is capable of killing his own daughter, underage daughter, then he's capable of killing anybody. So I'm waiting, and I think the rest of us at Unfound are waiting for the day when he is attached to other deaths, other murders, maybe other disappearances as well. There's no way that we believe that he just killed this one woman in Virginia and then his own daughter. There are certainly more than that. I think Dennis Bowman has been a dangerous guy for a long time. And that may mean even looking not just at the 1980s where when these two uh, murders were committed, but into the 90s, into the 2000s, up until this very day. I think anything is possible at this point. But her remains have been identified, and I just cannot tell you how much respect I give to Kathy Turkanian, Andrea's biological mother, who believed from day one, going back to when I interviewed her in 2016, that she believed that Andrea was on that property. There was no proof of it, but she just knew it, and she was right. It's just... That is just uh, amazing. And I'm glad that all of the work that she has put in over the last about 10 years uh, has not gone to waste. Um, I, I give her all uh, the credit in the world. Angela, have you talked to Andrea's sister? No. Uh, the Bowman's, you mean her... Her, her sister, you mean the Bowman's actual biological daughter? No, I have not. I've not talked to anybody in the Bowman family. Um, the Doe Patrol says, my dad is a Leo, and he loves all four of my pets, three cats and dog, even my turtle and the fish. He's a better grandpa than an owner. Well, I'm a Leo too, uh, the Doe Patrol. Uh, I was born August 1st, 1970. I'm going to be 50 here in a little more than two months. And, um, so I, I love animals too. Just can't take care of them. Just don't want that responsibility. I really don't. So Andrea Bowman, uh, I anticipate, uh, doing an in memoriam for her. Just don't know when that's going to be. Of course, we have an interview, uh, something for this Friday. I think I'm going to be doing uh, at least one interview this coming weekend. So, I don't know where I'm going to put it in the schedule. Maybe it'll be something that I release like on a Monday. I'm just not sure right at this point, but we will be doing an in memoriam for her, even though I know we did something for her back in November or early December when Dennis Bowman was charged with the, the other murder in, in Virginia and all that started to happen. I, I did an episode on that. That's how important I thought it was. Uh, but we'll be doing an in memoriam for. Uh, Andrea, just don't know when that's going to be. We've done a couple recently, and the reason that is is because some of these disappearances that we've covered have uh, been resolved, and that that's the the standard on Unfound. Uh, let's move on to this. Now, this is a big deal right here. Of course, you all know about this live show that you're watching right now, and this live show has been around since about October of 2017, uh, I'm thinking. And of course, uh, all of you know about the Think Tank, although only some of you are in there, and that's fine. Some of the premium Patreon members, of course, are members in the Think Tank. And that has been going on since the beginning of last year, maybe. Maybe the beginning of 2019, or uh, somewhere around there. Certainly not as long as the live show, as this show. Well, Unfound has something new that it's adding to its array of everything else uh, that we already do. Once again, we do the episodes, which without the episodes, there is no Unfound. We do this live show. We do the Think Tank. And of course, we are on most of, of the social media platforms. And 
this Sunday, we are going to be introducing something new. Now, to start, it's going to be also for premium Patreon members. So it's going to be the Think Tank. And then right after that, there's going to be this new program that we are doing. However, we're throwing around the idea there are no promises as of yet that even though the Think Tank stuff remains private, we may do something down the road where this particular program, even though it is also meant for premium Patreon members, may then, after the fact, be able to be viewed or listened to by everybody. Once again, that is not a promise. It's just something we're talking about. But uh, this uh, program is going to be based in education. But instead of using, for example, with the Think Tank, we use the case for that week. For this live show, what do I do? It's like a smorgasbord of things going on with Unfound along with some national, new, national news. Well, this new program, it's going to be called Unfound on the Ground. And the logo made by uh, assistant Natasha, actually, it's going to be, actually, if you see the logo, it's being called On the Ground Presented by Unfound. And this is something that I've been talking about, I may be saying what, for about six weeks now, something that uh, my assistants have been working on. And I've kind of, I wouldn't say I've taken a back seat, but it's something that they've put together. And it's going, this uh, new program is going to be hosted by my assistant, Dr. Eric Grabowski. And the goal of this program is education. Being that somebody was just asking me uh, about, well, I think I would, you know, me personally, I would make a good college professor. Maybe. Well, what Unfound on the Ground is, is going to do is every week there's going to be a new theme. And each theme each week is going to be about uh, advocacy, investigation, and research. And it's going to be like the opposite of like the think tank. Of course, with the think tank, we have the case for that week. We talk about it, and then we talk about some unfound uh, missing person theory, and we talk about how it might apply to other disappearances that unfound is covered. With the On the Ground program, what we're going to do is we're going to start with themes, themes regarding missing persons cases, and then use cases as examples. And once again, Dr. Eric Grabowski is going to be doing this. The reason that is, is that, uh, first of all, it was his idea. And it was an idea I liked a lot. And this idea came up because of what has been going on over the last two months. There are a lot of other podcasts and YouTube shows that um, have increased their programs because, of course, a lot of people, there's no movies. Um, we know that things have been added to Netflix. I've noticed some of the channels that I watch on YouTube that have nothing to do with missing persons or true crime. Um, they've added more shows because more people are at home. And so when Eric, that's was something that was on my mind and Eric came up with the idea and I said, great. And I said, well, yeah, you do it. Get, let's get it done. And of course, Eric is a college professor. He is, when I say he is a doctor, I don't mean he's a medical doctor. He's a uh, doctor of education of some type. I, I don't have his cred credentials right in front of me, but he has experience speaking to students uh, in a classroom. Uh, and that's what he does as his real profession. But he's also uh, a missing persons advocate. He's also a missing persons researcher. Uh, as I think may, and many of you know, he appeared on Unfound about three, uh, three hours, three years ago for the Donna Mikolenko episode. And then he became an assistant, I would say at the beginning of 2019, because I put him on a certain job that needed done and he ended up getting it done. And, and that was great. And so he brought this idea to me and I said, great, Let's get it done. Do what you want to do. And, and I was not the person who came up with the, with the name uh, of it. Uh, 
although with the logo, kind of Natasha and I work together on that. So I'm very excited about this. And so what we're going to try to do, and I'm, like I said, I'm not running it. I will be listening on Sunday night, but I will not, it will certainly not be like what I'm doing here. It will not be like what I'm doing for the think tank. Eric will be in the forefront and he will be handling uh, the business for uh, unfound on the ground. Um, what we're trying to do is make people better advocates, make people better investigators, make people better researchers, uh, using a lot of the techniques that all of us at Unfound already use. I'm not going to say that we are experts or anything, but uh, the way we find people, like the way Emily finds people, the way we contact people, the way we use databases and all of these things will eventually, I believe, be part of this program. Although, once again, each week it's going to be a different theme. Uh, that's what Eric is calling it. Maybe you might call it subject or topic. He's calling them themes perfectly fine by me. And he will be the one who will be talking about it. And like I said, it's going to be on Zoom. It's not going to be on YouTube. It's not Facebook Live. It's going to be in the Zoom format, which uh, people can decide to whether you, to use their cameras or not, or just use audio. It will be up to them. And I think a lot of people, a lot of you out there are very familiar with Zoom because a lot of famous people that have been doing shows, maybe you've even seen on like late night shows, et cetera, have been using this program Zoom, Zoom to be interviewed. And you've seen maybe bands that are using Zoom to play together. And I think that's why Eric picked that format to do it. Um, let me see some of these comments. Sherla, uh, still talking about being a Leo. Uh, hello, a little bit. Good to see you tonight. Uh, Sherlock, if you need any assistance, I can be at your disposal. I, uh, I appreciate that, Sherlock. Uh, you've done a lot of great things for Unfound. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. Um, uh, Kristen, I think I may be spelling it wrong. Can send me the link for Patreon. Thank you, Sheree, for setting that up. Um, Blaze says, Kristen Rose, just press on the dollar sign. Um, so that is the new program. It's going to be an education program. I think that education, uh, has been something that I've personally been talking about for a while. I've been expressing for a while how I would like to go to college campuses and talk to criminal justice majors, and even it, uh, maybe psychology majors, journalism majors, about reporting of missing persons cases, the investigation of missing persons cases, uh, the trauma that families feel, feel in missing persons cases, and all about educating young people who may have to deal with that in their jobs one day. And so it might be somewhere down the road where we have kind of a, uh, a two pronged attack where I am going to colleges, uh, uh, around the United States speaking. And then we have this unfound on the ground where we are educating the public, people who aren't in school anymore, people who are accountants and teachers and football coaches and engineers and truck drivers, et cetera, about everything that needs to be known uh, about conducting investigations, becoming more knowledgeable about missing persons cases in general. So it may be somewhere down the road where we are, we have like a two pronged uh, attack. So I'm excited about it. It starts this Sunday on Patreon and uh, it will start as soon as the think tank is over. So we're going to have to wrap up the think tank in an hour. And that's going to be a little difficult considering, uh, everything that will be in this Friday's episode, but we'll do our best. So, uh, like I said, Dr. Eric Grabowski will be leading the discussion. The new program is called unfound on the ground, and it will be, uh, conducted through zoom. And for all you premium Patreon members, uh, you will get uh, an invitation either through the very private think tank group or 
uh, through patreon.com, uh, a post that only all of you will be able to see. Uh, we will post the link so you can click on it uh, so you can take part on Sunday night after the think tank. Um, if you're going to use your phone, you'll probably have to use an app. And for some of you, depending on if you have a MacBook or an app or an iPad or a regular Dell laptop, you're probably going to have to make some, um, you're probably going to have to look into that a little bit before Sunday gets here. So, uh, that is what is coming and, uh, I'm fully in support of it. I of course hope it goes well. Like I said, I will be just listening on Sunday evening. I will not, uh, be in the, uh, the center, be the center of attention for once. And that's great. I'm certainly, I certainly don't, uh, would not have the time to put something like that together on my own. I certainly have enough things going on as it is. And so I'm more than happy to allow somebody else to, uh, to run something along with uh, the other assistants uh, as uh, for support, support and also taking part in this new unfound on the ground. And the reason I didn't come up with that title, but I think that the reason the title the name of this new program on the ground makes sense. It's, it's no different than when you think about maybe a political campaign or just war itself. When people talk about having boots on the ground, people, for example, in a political campaign, people going door to door, it's like an army out there handing out flyers, knocking on doors, calling people, Hey, make sure you don't show up to make sure you remember to show up to vote. Will you consider voting for this candidate? It's like an army, creating an army of people with a particular agenda. That's what I think you think of when you hear the statement on the ground, boots on the ground, people on the ground. Uh, I think that's even used for searches regarding missing persons cases. We need to get some people on the ground so they can walk around and uh, do searches, canvas the area. And it's convenient that it rem rem uh, rhymes with the title of the program, Unfound. That certainly works out. But we're going to try to put more people on the ground by educating them. And so I think uh, it's a great title. I love the logo that Natasha has put together. I think it signifies, um, it captures uh, the ideas uh, that Eric will have in this new program. Uh, Susan said, sounds great. Kind of like answering questions that we ask of you. Like, what do we do if our loved one goes missing? Uh, I'm sure that's going to be covered eventually, uh, this, uh, in this program, Susan. Miranda says she'll be there. Great. Little bit says, I really like this. Um, Miranda says maybe the host could introduce them himself with a little video on Patreon. Uh, I, I'm not sure Eric is watching the show tonight, but uh, I think that's a pretty good idea, Miranda. Will we need the Zoom app or will the link take us to Zoom without the app? Uh, Paula, what I would say, it just depends on how you're going to be viewing it. If you're on your phone, I know from my experience and having Zoom conversations with my sister and my two brothers over the last month or so, I have the Zoom app on my Android phone. However, on the other hand, when I did the interview with Dr. Telesco, that was also on Zoom on my Dell, I don't think I, I think I still had to download something, but it's not like an app. It's just different. But uh, I would certainly, once again, don't wait till Sunday to figure that out. I would be figuring that out between now and Sunday regarding Zoom and how it works on your particular phone, tablet, or computer. Paula says, is Patreon just for U.S. or international? Uh, Patreon is for everybody, Paula. Doesn't matter. Uh, I think it automatically does the conversion uh, to dollars if you are interested. And I know that I do have certainly have some Patreon supporters from other countries. Uh, yeah, little bit says, if you're using your phone, you have to have the Zoom app. Yes. Uh, Heather, uh, assistant Heather says, yes, you need the app on both Android and iPhone. Thank you. Now I'm going to read something that um, Eric printed out. Just I've done my pitch. I've done my uh, little spiel on it. But let me read something that um, – let me get it here. 
uh, that he has typed out just to once again give you uh, uh, an idea of about Unfound on the ground. Starting at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday, May 24th, uh, raising awareness of missing persons, mindsets, and methods will be the first Unfound on the ground digital discussion encompassing care, communication, and collaboration. This is a great theme to begin the Unfound on the Ground series of discussions. Lasting about an hour and a half, the discussion will be led by Dr. Eric Grabowski, who has a PhD in rhetoric from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Coincidentally, that's where my mother went to college. Beyond his teaching and study of communication within academia, Eric is a cold case journalist he has been a guest on Unfound, once again, going back to April 2017. Uh, you can go back and listen to the Donna Michalenko episode. Eric is part of Unfound's assistant team. That is true. Patreon subscribers who are automatic think tank members will be invited to participate in this digital discussion through Zoom. Audio content from this discussion will be distributed in the future. However, for the session, your participation is important. So if you are not a Think Tank member, now would be a great time to take that step. Please visit patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast to learn more about unfound subscription options on Patreon. That is something that Eric typed out. And like he said in there, um, uh, this uh, audio content from this discussion will be distributed in the future. Not once again, not making any promises. I'm really not in control of this. All I'm doing is overseeing it and make sure it meets unfound standards. But I think that it may be uh, somewhat like, you know, when a movie comes out and then it comes out, you know, in the theaters, of course, not right now, but when things are normal, a movie comes out and then maybe two months later it comes out like on Netflix or Disney Plus or on uh, pay, you know, subscription or something on your TV, it may be something like that where it becomes available to think tank members and then maybe a month down the line, a few months down the line, uh, it then that audio will be for everybody. They'll just have to wait a little bit. Once again, we're throwing around a couple ideas. I just don't want to make any promises uh, right now. And in fact, in the end, it will be up to Eric and the other people who have been working on it uh, to decide for themselves. Um, Kristen says, just signed up for $12 a month. I love it, Kristen. Thank you. Hope that gets me into the think tank. It automatically does. Um, if you are on Facebook, I will get you into the private think tank group, Kristen, and then we'll get you the link for uh, the think tank starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then on the ground will take place at 8 p.m. right afterwards. You'll figure it out, Kristen. I got confidence. Paula says, Kristen, you will love the think tank. I think so, too. Uh, say again what disappearance Eric was on. He was on the Donna Michalenko episode. It is the That was is still the oldest unsolved disappearance in the state of North Dakota. Donna Michalenko. M-I-C-H-A-L-E-N-K-O. There you go. Deborah says she's in UK too. I love having these people from the United Kingdom. Welcome. There you go. So that is the new program show, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, class uh, discussion panel. I suppose we could come up with all sorts of different synonyms uh, for it. And uh, this certainly is going in the direction that um, that I envisioned for this program, not just covering cases, but educating people, whether it's the general public who have their own careers and own jobs that have nothing to do with missing persons cases or educating young people who may have jobs in the future that do involve uh, uh, missing persons cases. This is, uh, this is the long-term plan. Once again, if you are watching tonight, I would appreciate it if you would hit the like button for this video, the little thumbs up part. Uh, I see how many people we have in here, and we always like to get really close to that number 
of people who are watching. So do not forget that. Hopefully you can figure that out on the device that you're using and like this video if you could. Um, <laughs> a little bit. I forgot I'm paying for the think tank. Well, a little bit. Uh, if you're going to pay for it, we'd love you to take part. We don't want your money to go to waste. I mean, um, if you are a member, we want you in there. It's important that you are in there. Okay, everybody, I, and I realize we don't get as many people in the think tank as are people who are eligible for it, but we want you all in there. We want you all, all of you. Uh <laughs> Okay, Paula says she's already hit the like button. Well, some people out there haven't yet, and that's why I got to mention it. Let's move on. So that's uh, one once again, unfound on the ground. Uh, I don't think that the new logo or the new sign for that, uh, this new creation has been put like on the page and in the group yet. Uh, I will do that. I will also post it on Instagram before Sunday gets here. And I will, of course, be talking about it on the episode on Friday, and I will continue to be pushing it. I'm not going to let any of you forget about it between now and Sunday. Let's move on to some other things. Being that Heather is in here, uh, we are slowly, I don't know if it's slowly, it's, it's faster than slowly, but we are gently moving t shirt production. Uh, back in house, and who's going to be doing that? None other than Assistant Heather, who is in here. Um, over the past few days, uh, she's been giving uh, given quite a bit more control over the uh, Shopify account, my Shopify account for Unfound. But I also want to, because this is something that Heather already does. Uh, she did talk about that. Uh, at least a little bit when I interviewed her for the team episode a couple weeks ago. And if uh, she's very creative, she is redesigning all the shirts because she has told me that my designs weren't that good. I don't take that personally, but um, she's uh, had being redesigned. Unfortunately tonight I'm wearing one of the old ones, but I have worn the new one on the, uh, on the show before. And in fact, I think I've worn it for the think tank too. But she is now going to be uh, have creative control and practically all control on the T-shirts that are created for the episodes. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's going to streamline the process a little bit. And uh, that will give her an opportunity because she knows what she's doing regarding all of this. And uh, that makes me feel uh, really good. But I should know that Heather does have her own business, and I would appreciate it. If uh, you would also check out just all the other things that she does, if you would go to the Facebook page, Heather I Let Designs on Facebook. That's Heather A Y L E T T E Designs. Why is my phone ringing? I'm going to have to put this on mute. Hold on a second. I should have put that on mute before I started. Okay, there we go. Um, but yes, Heather, assistant Heather is going to be taking charge of the t-shirt situation. And I think that'll put it on a very, uh, it's in very capable hands. Uh, I think we're going in a very, uh, positive direction there. We still have to work out streaming, lining a little bit and getting, uh, situated, um, with ordering and some things, but this kind of stuff just takes some time and I'm sure that we will figure it all out. And once again, if you want to check out Heather's uh, store, her page on Facebook, it's Facebook. It's Heather. I let designs. Uh, you spell, I let a Y L E T T E design Heather. I let design. And she also has uh, a, my shop, my Shopify uh, store as well. Um, Paula says, I love the shirts. Nice job, Heather. There you go. There you go. Another order. Uh, I'm hoping you got that. Paula, Heather has done a few things for me and my daughter. Love her stuff. Um, Kristen, pressing on the dollar sign and signing up for the think tank was different, right? The, yeah, those are two different things, uh, Kristen. That's right. Uh, to sign up for Patreon, just go to patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. 
The dollar sign you see in here is super chat. That's for un uh, that is for YouTube only. And that's just kind of for people who feel like contributing to the program while they're watching tonight. Uh, different live shows on YouTube use the super chat for different reasons. But if you'd like a particular comment, um, really noticed super chat is a good way to do that. If you'd like to ask a, a particular important question that you think I might miss because of the chat going by uh, and you don't want me to miss it, then, um, that's a good way to use the super chat to do that as well. Uh, so they are different. Uh, so close Ed. uh, what so close. What are you talking about? Heather? I'm so close to what? Uh, Kristen, I wanted to be a part of the think tank. Well, you're going to be in there. If you signed up at Patreon, Kristen, you're in, you are in, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, hello fishing. Glad to be able to watch you again. Hello fishing. Good to see you too. Um, the dope patrol. Okay. Heather, Kristen, you want to go to Patreon for the think tank? Yes. Heather, I, I let. I let, I'm sorry, Heather. I I've never seen that, that name before Heather. That's why I messed it up. What do I know? Uh, Sheree says Heather has made many things for me personally and I would highly recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Good quality. Absolutely. And that's, that's the only way it would, it would happen. Uh, if, if, is if I thought that she was going to do a good job and I, I'm sure she's going to, let's move on to, uh, some other things. Uh, I can't say too much about this because this is something that we are still working on, but we are, uh, researching, investigating the, the belief that Dal Phillips has been seen in another town, not too far away from where he disappeared, um, uh, back in the early 2010s, 20 teens. Uh, if you go back, that is a disappearance that we covered near the end of 2017, 2017, two and a half years ago. And, um, like I said, I can't go into all the specifics, unfortunately, but, uh, let's just say that I talked to his wife recently and she had some things to say and she was getting some information and we have taken upon ourselves to see if we can verify this for her. Now, you know how I think what I think about eyewitness sightings. I usually don't put a lot of stock in them, but the way that his wife is explaining this to me, I think is worth our time. I don't know how much time it's going to take to verify or to verify that it actually is Dow or it isn't Dow. I don't know. Of course, none of us live near there. It's not like we can drive right there and start cruising around this town to look for him. But we have at least a small plan in place to try to figure out if this is just rumorizing, if if this is a cruel trick or something, or could it be the Dow has been living in this other town, not too far away this whole time. Uh, if you will remember just to go over the generalities of his disappearance, um, Missy, who is his wife went out to get her mother. When she came back, he was gone and some rumors were floating around. If he was having problems with, uh, a family member, uh, a neighbor allegedly saw a van in the driveway while Missy was going to get her mother. Uh, there was allegedly saw a dog scent that, that allegedly followed Dow walking away down the road. There was a guy who worked at a business near there that, that the family was suspicious of. And Dow was having some issues in, in his life. And there was also the idea maybe he did just walk off. Uh, but uh, this is a surprise to me. And we're going to do what we can to figure this out. I, I think that the, the good news is that one of the places he was cited 
uh, we have the ability to find out a list of people who were there. And so we're going to find out, try to find out if any of these people actually saw him there and whether they even knew that he was missing. So it's um, very surprising. Very, uh, if this is true, I will be, this will be one of those other ones where Wild did not see that coming, kind of like Crystal Morrison's disappearance. I don't think anybody could have guessed that she'd been found a quarter mile from where she was last seen. If this is true, and of course, I hope that Dow is still alive. I don't know why he would have left his family and everything, and I, maybe that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. But if he is still alive and this is actually true, then I, I have to say that I'm happy that he's alive. I think he's a horrible guy from le for leaving his family. But I'm happy that he is alive and maybe something can come of that. But uh, I'm not so sure right at this second that he is alive. And that's why uh, we have to check into this. I don't know how much the police are doing. I think that they're just taking a lot of people's word on this. So we're going to see what we can do for Missy. So once again, that's the disappearance of Doc Phillips. Is that if that's not one that you've listened to yet, an episode uh, that occurred in Helen Helenwood, Tennessee. I forget the year right off the top of my head. Maybe 2012, 2011. So let me check that just to be sure. Or uh, let me see this. Where is it? He's right here. Uh, 2012. I was right. Wow. Okay. Uh, 2012 is when he disappeared from Helenwood, Tennessee. He was a preacher, Paula. You're correct. So if we, if I can give you any updates, uh, as we proceed through this, I will, I just don't know how much I'm going to be able to say because the information first will be going to his wife. And like I said, I've been talking to her over the last few days. Um, Kristen says she's looking forward to the think tank. I'm looking forward to seeing you there, Kristen. Um, Cherie said, uh, regarding Dow Phillips, one issue I thought about today was his disability check. If he's using a different name, then he can't be getting his check. Cherie, that's a good point. That's something we'll have to contemplate. No doubt about it. Um, but this is what Unfound does. Just because the episode is over doesn't mean the work is over. Certainly true. Uh, Sheree, I think that people might be a little surprised how we continue to work on disappearances after they've already been episodes. I'm not saying that happens on every one, but it's kind of weird, uh, at least for me, uh, how that can happen sometimes. Not all the time. I'm not even saying 50% of the time, but uh, we are surely not a group that once the episode has come out, we kind of forget about it. If things pop up, we'll go right back to it. No problem. Um, 2012. Thank you for the case recommendations bookkeeper. Oh, that was you bookkeeper that gave, you were asking me about um, maybe some disappearances where uh, the suspect isn't quite as obvious as maybe some of the ones we've done recently. Uh, yeah, those were some, I mean, really bookkeeper, if you go through our, all 170 disappearances, you're going to find quite a few where there are either no suspects or multiple ones. So if that's what you're looking for, you will find them quite a few. Uh, so that's that Dal Phillips. I had no idea I'd be giving an update on him, uh, this show, but this just happened within the last few days. Uh, next issue I want to talk about is, and this is something that was posted in the group, and that is Cameron Remmer. There are a group of individuals in San Francisco. I'm not saying, I don't know if they were motivated by Unfound's coverage of Cameron at the end of uh, 2019. I don't know, but I think we did a lot of great work on uh, his disappearance and being able to find some of these people who encountered him that night. And if you remember these two um, bellhops or security guys, I should say security guys didn't want to talk to me or my assistant Sheree about what went on that night, which made us suspicious. Well, a picture has been taken of a man in San Francisco 
who some people think it looks a lot like Cameron. And uh, I think if you were in the discussion group on Facebook, then you've seen this picture. I have to say, I, and nothing has really transpired uh, since the picture was posted last week. I don't think that they've been able to track this guy down since then. Uh, right now, I don't know what to make of it. I will be honest, what concerns me about seeing that picture, I will not de deny that the way the picture is taken, it does look like Cameron a little bit. The problem I have is that the person p p p p person who took the picture couldn't get a picture, you know, just straight up face. Why, why is the picture, why is he looking down? Why could they not get a picture of him just looking at the camera or even video him and post it online, something like that, instead of just one solitary picture with him looking down at his phone? Don't know. I would also say that uh, it almost, if you, if this is possible, it almost maybe looks a little bit too much like him. We have to remember that nine years have passed, almost since he disappeared, and he should not look. I, I I don't care if he's been living on the street. I don't care if he's changed his name and found a new job and everything else. He's not going to look like he did nine years ago. And, and the problem I have is this guy looks like Cameron did nine years ago. He doesn't look like how Cameron will look nine years later. He should look like Cameron uh, 2011 plus nine. He shouldn't look like Cameron 2011. So that's a concern of mine as well. Um, the person, what I found out is the person who encountered this guy, that this, this, per, this guy would not... Uh, did not answer to Cameron. He uh, seems to be have some sort of mental affliction. He seemingly might be some might be some sort of drug addict. Which, given what Cameron was into, maybe that's not hard to believe. We also know that Cameron also had his share of mental issues that he struggled with. So those things would certainly fall in line. Um, but on the other hand, it's been nine years. How did he manage to live with all of these things for nine years? So I don't know what to think. Uh, I've had a conversation with his mother, Valerie, and, uh, I, I was very honest with her as I always am. I, I told her that I have my doubts. Of course, I want it to be Cameron, uh, Despite what I think about those security guys from the Fairmont Hotel, I want it to be Cameron. I just think there's some reasons right now to believe that it's not him. I just, I just think so. Um, I would feel a lot better had they gotten a picture of him looking right at the camera. I would have uh, felt a lot better if they actually had a conversation with him and at least tried to record it. Of course, with technology these days, that should be very easy to do. Get video of him from far away and not even realizing it. And these kinds of things, you know, start going through my mind of why they didn't do that. And the other problem is that you take a picture at any particular angle and you can make two people uh, look similar. Like people say that I look like uh, Jason Bateman. Not with this hair. <laughs> and even when I have shorter hair, maybe, but maybe at certain angles. But I think if you put Jason Bateman and myself beside each other, we really don't look alike, even though we're like the same age, maybe the same height, maybe have, I don't know what his nationality is, you know, where he descends from is who his ancestors were, but at certain angles we may look like, but we don't look alike. So that also comes to mind as I look at, at that picture of this guy in San Francisco. You know, I weirdly enough, I think of the, you ever see the movie game night with coincidentally Jason Bateman and the one woman who says that she had sex with Denzel Washington. Have you seen that movie? And then she pulls out a picture that she has on her phone of this guy who was allegedly Denzel and he kind of looks like Denzel, but it's not. This is kind of what it reminds me of. I hope I'm wrong, but um, 
I just, you know, they're just reasons for me to not think it's that it's not Cameron. Um, maybe it was because of the 52 emails I sent. <laughs> 52 emails. You're going to have to remind me what that was. Sherry, unfortunately, uh, Kathy says, I do not think that that is Cameron in the picture. Kathy, thank you. Uh, good to see you here, Kathy. Um, Fishing says I can't type because I broke my glasses. Okay. Um, uh, Kristen, I thought said I, something like you can have the unfound on the front and the disappearance you choose on the back. You can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, talk to Heather. She can help you out. She can get it done. Uh, Ed, could you show the back of your shirt, even though it's not the new design? Um, I have a first year, I have a unique shirt here, Heather, but I will do so. Yes. I have all the first, let me, this is what the back of this shirt looks like. Those are all of the, uh, first year cases, which, uh, really Heather and I have not talked about that, but this is, uh, a first year, all the cases from the first year of unfound, all the pictures put together on the back. So, uh, it's not, sorry about that, Heather. I'm sorry. I didn't wear uh, like a regular shirt tonight, but, um, that's right, Kristen. Yes. Unfound on the front and a picture on the back. Yes. The dope patrol, Cameron, who Cameron Remmer, uh, Cherie says, I was think Jennifer Aniston, funny Cherie. I don't think I want to get into that. Maybe I do. Maybe before we're done, Cherie. Um, okay. Kristen. Yeah, fine. Kristen, find Heather on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm just not sure what to think of that. I, I want to believe it's Cameron. And I think that if people are who are hoping it is he, uh, look at that guy and say, oh, that's definitely Cameron. I don't know. It's just not, you'd think that a picture would, I mean, one picture should solve the issue. The problem is, is that the picture just causes more questions, uh, about, I, I think that it, here's what I think. I think if it was just a straight on picture, like me looking at this camera on my computer right now, I think we would certainly know one way or the other. The problem was whoever took the picture didn't get that, you know, direct, uh, you know, right at his face picture. And then I start to wonder why, well, why didn't they? So if I have any updates, I'll let you know, but, um, just don't know. Um, and the thing, you know, the other part problem is that what I've been led to believe is that this guy is in that area all the time. Well, that picture that I posted on Facebook was like last Thursday. Well, it's six days later, no more pictures of him. Nobody can find him. I don't know. I just, I just, so many times that happens. It, it, it just, I cannot even begin to tell you how many times that happens in missing persons cases. Oh yeah. I just saw, yeah, this person was here. It's like Claudia Wells. Perfect example. Oh yeah. She was here. She was homeless. She's here all the time. Her daughter, Robin goes to find her. She's not there anymore. And I can't tell you how many disappearances or missing persons cases are like that. Why? I think a lot of it's made up. I'm just, I, I, I can't come to any other conclusion. I think it's just people infusing themselves into disappearances because they like the attention. Once again, I hope it's Cameron. But when people who took this picture say, well, he's here all the time, he's always in the area, and then it's six days later, and people who are trying to find him and take more pictures can't find him, then I start to wonder what the heck's going on. Um, okay. Oh, something else being that I mentioned Heather and her store, I have to mention that one of my other assistants has, uh, her own, she actually has two things going on uh, Natasha, who, you know, uh, does the website and, uh, made the new picture for the new unfound on the ground. And she also manages the YouTube channel. 
Um, she has a couple podcasts of her own that she's just started, and I felt obligated to mention them. One of them is called White Noise Level 3. I don't know why it's called that, so don't ask. <laughs> but it's called White Noise Level 3. And then the other podcast that she does is Charla G. So C-H-A-R-L-A space G-I. So I think that if you do a search maybe on, I don't think she's on Podomatic, but if you do a search on Stitcher, maybe she's in the iTunes store. I don't know. But I think if you do maybe a Google search for either one of those, you will, you will hear my assistant, Natasha, uh, doing her own uh, shows. She doesn't do true crime. Um, I think she just does variety of topics, whatever she feels like, and that's fine. But once again, one of them is called White Noise Level 3, and the other show is called Charla G, right? Yeah. Charla G, C-H-A-R-L-A space G-I. Uh, Renee Lamana, Sharia is, but yeah, Renee Lamana is a great example, Sharia, about how people say they saw her and then when people show up, she's not there. Perfect example. She was allegedly seen at a bar. She was seen on a New York subway. She was seen in a car dealership. No video, nothing. Just poof. And I, when it's like those situations, I just tend to dismiss all of them. Now, her sister, Margaret, who was the guest for that episode, disagrees with me, and that's fine. Uh, but, you know, I continue to believe that that night that Renee ran off, she ran off, and there's like a swamp area right there on that kind of island, and I think that's where she ended up. Either that or she went into the ocean. I don't like thinking that way. I, I wish I was wrong, but I just don't believe these sightings. So it has to be something else must have happened. Kristen is telling us how amazing we all are. I agree, Kristen. We're all amazing. All of us. Not just me, but the assistants and all of you watching tonight. We're all amazing. Let's move on to uh, a couple disappearances that have been in the news. I'm going to talk about Madison Bell first, which is the newer one. And then I'm going to talk about Suzanne Morfu, Morfu, who disappeared uh, in Colorado on Mother's Day. I'm going to talk about both these, uh, just analyzing them. Now, I will admit that in Madison Bell's disappearance, I know more than the public does. And there's just certain things that I can't say. Just going to leave it at that. Whereas with Suzanne's, I don't know any more than, than the rest of you. Now, as far as Madison goes, uh, given that her car was there, the car was there, the phone was there, and the keys were in the car, that is not a very positive development. Um, you, you know, whether... Any, of course, any missing persons case, no matter what the other extraneous things may be about phones and keys, they're all scary. And some of them, of course, we know can go unsolved for a very long time. But if she, her phone and her keys were missing, I actually might feel a little bit better, not real good or anything, but I might have a totally different opinion on the disappearance. But being that her phone and the keys, were left in the car. You know, you have to think of it this way. Um, she, the car was parked in the church lot. She was says she, she said she was going to tan. My understanding is when this lot got busy over there, that the spillover, some people did park in the church lot, which, which was about 300 to 400 feet away, maybe over a little over a football field. I guess that makes sense. The problem is it was a Sunday morning. How busy would a parking lot be at that time? I could see it maybe be, being busy, you know, even in the restrictions that are people living under right now, one o'clock on a Saturday, but 10 a.m. on a Sunday. 
in addition, in addition to that, my understanding is that ch- that this church was ha- is having services despite all the COVID stuff that was going on. So it's just hard to understand. I think what it says is if she parked in that lot because she w- because there was overflow, well, wouldn't she if she was walking to the tanning salon from the church parking lot, wouldn't she take her phone and the keys with her? Wouldn't she? Yes. So the only other option, and she didn't get to the tanning salon, so something happened once she got there. So are we to believe somebody was just hanging out in that church lot waiting for a young girl to pull in to to be kidnapped on a Sunday morning out in the middle of nowhere in Ohio? That doesn't seem very reasonable either. I think what I'm saying is that I could be convinced that she wasn't going to tan at all. And I have the feeling that she was actually meeting somebody there that morning. And the tanning was a story. Uh, I think there, there are reasons, there are things that you can infer from the information that's been given to the public to think that this uh, girl... Uh, who just graduated, I guess, from high school or was about to, uh, was not going to tan at all. There was something go else going on here. This is, you know, this is kind of the same situation like Mara Murray. People who believe that she wrecked her car and then she got picked up by some serial killer. Well, you know, that has happened. It's in the history of the United States that has happened. I think of Morgan Harrington who disappeared when she went to a Metallica concert. And somehow she found herself on the outside of the venue again, couldn't get back in. And then she got picked up by a rapist, the guy who had already raped before, didn't know it though, picked her up and then killed her. And you think, oh, well, yeah, it happens. Well, you also have to remember though, that this guy was seemed to be cruising around that college campus there where Metallica was playing. Um. And so he was cruising around looking for somebody. It would what you might want to call a target rich atmosphere. He was looking for a young woman to pick up and rape, if not kill. So he was driving around, driving around a college campus. Makes sense. Whereas it's hard to believe that some guy was driving around out in the middle of nowhere on a Sunday morning looking for a, a young girl to abduct and kidnap. That just doesn't seem like a very target rich atmosphere. Unless some guy knew she was going to be there that week, you know, at that time and was wait, you know, kind of saying, oh, I think I know Madison's going to be here. So I'm going to cruise by and I'm going to snatch her up. Still really doesn't explain why the keys in the phone, even if she got snatched up, how did the keys in the phone end up in the car? What did the guy do? Take her and then throw those things back in there. That doesn't make a lot of sense either. So there's something going on here. And I I have to believe that Madison was lying uh, to her mother and the, any other people that were in the house uh, that that morning. Something's going on there. Some it just there just doesn't seem to be a lot of. It's not logical. It's not rational. So because of that, remember things can be logical. Things can be rational, but not necessarily logical. Um, and but things can, you know, not be both. And this doesn't fit either criteria. So I'm suspicious. I think there's things going on here that uh, the public doesn't know about, and I think I could be convinced that she was meeting somebody there that she didn't want to tell anybody about me. I know that her boyfriend was allegedly at the house. Well, maybe she had another boyfriend. Just a possibility. Um, there you go, Kristen. That's, uh, that's the, uh, super chat. Thank you. I see the thumbs up. There you go. I don't know how this works, but I'm trying it out. Thank you, Kristen. Well, thank you. That's the super chat, everybody. And Kristen gets recognized. 
Concha says, so odd. She had tanned the previous two days, supposedly. I don't know anything about that, Concha. I really don't. Uh, the Dope Patrol. I had Madison confused with this other girl. I know this case, but not well. Um, go with it, Dope Patrol. You might be right. Uh, Mari Mari didn't get picked up. She ran into the woods and died of the elements. Uh, Kristen, that's what I continue to believe at, at this to this day. Um... So there's just there's just some things going on in this disappearance. Uh, you know, it's been how long now? Uh, it, it you know how long? How many days has it been since she went missing? Uh, was it this past Sunday, right? Or has it been a week and a half now? Time just goes by. Uh, and you know, once again, there are other things that I know that I can't talk about, but I think what I just said here encapsulates, um, I don't think that I'm skewing anything. I think what I'm standing here is the truth. I just can't give you more details, but the details that I know behind the scenes kind of fit just what I told you here. I'm sorry. I can't, I was told that some of these things in confidence, I apologize, but I'm being truthful with you in my analysis of it. Um, the Doe Patrol and the Suzanne Morfu case, the, the sheriff said he's still cooperating with us and hope he continues to do so uh, regarding the husband. I'm going to get to that one next, Doe Patrol. I certainly hope, of course, that Madison Bell, um, you know, I think the, the good news is that looking at her disappearance in those terms, then it should be fairly easy to determine who she would have been meeting there in that church parking lot that morning. Should be very easy to do that. However, it also could be that... No, I'll just leave it at that. I can't, I, I'm sorry, I can't say any more than that. All I'm going to say is that I don't believe that there's some stranger out there who picked Madison up. I think that something else uh, went on and is continuing to go on once again for the reasons that I just stated. So um, it's just hard to believe anybody would be sitting there waiting for her to show up to abduct her. You know, some stranger. It's just not believable. So let's move on to Suzanne. Morfu, I, I'm sorry that I've not heard her name pronounced Morfu. I just don't know. I'm just going to call her Suzanne. She disappeared on Mother's Day, so that would be a week and a half ago. She went out for a bike ride. Uh, coincidentally, she is my age, 49 years old. She has two teenage daughters. And she is married. Uh, she and her husband had moved from Indiana two years ago to 2018. And at the time, her husband, uh, allegedly, I'm not trying to put any suspicion on him or anything, but the story is, is that he was two and a half hours away in Denver when this all happened. Now, what I've also found out is that one of the family members who's been a spokesman says that the bike that she was riding has been found. I don't know where it was found. I don't know if it was found near her house. I don't know if it was found 10 miles away or wherever. I don't know where she would go biking. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it seems that the bike has been found somewhere. In addition, the house itself has been what they call cordoned off. So I guess they put in that yellow police tape around it and for some reason, even though it is believed that she went missing while bike riding. So I don't, once again, I don't have any inside information on this, unlike the inside information I have on Madison's disappearance. So they're looking at the house for some reason that I don't know why cordoning it off. That would almost, almost make it sound like they think that it's a crime scene. So I don't know. What's unclear to me, though, let me read some of these. Um, yeah, uh, you're right, Doe Patrol. The boyfriend does live with Madison. Uh, I'm not so she felt trapped. Um, 
I, I'm not, I'm just not going to get into, you know, she felt trapped. I don't know if she did or not. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm just looking at uh, the way the facts have been presented and the facts that are public kind of go along with some things that I'm sure are true that have been told to me in confidence. Um, more, f more few, I, I guess. Um, okay. <laughs> Kristen says that's, that's a really good French last name there, Kristen. I'm not going to say it. Uh, no one can say it unless you're fluent in French. Yeah. Uh, Cherie says it's a bit of an issue going back to Madison's disappearance It's a bit of an issue for me that he's lived with them since Maddie was 14. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But in Suzanne's case, there are, th there are some things to me that seem a little weird. It's Mother's Day. Why was her husband two and a half hours away on Mother's Day when they have two daughters? And, and the other interesting thing is nowhere, at least in the stories that I could find, I'm not saying it's not out there, but I looked like five different, six different articles. Where were her daughters that day? Were they at home? Do they not? I, they, they, they're teenage daughters. So I'm guessing at least one of them is in high school or something. Where were they this day? This is Mother's Day. I, you know, Mother's Day, you'd think that that would be spent with family. The daughters would be with their mother. The father, the you know, the husband would be there and they'd be doing something. Instead, there's no news of where the daughters were that day. And the husband was two and a half hours away on Mother's Day. And she is going out for a bike ride by herself on Mother's Day. Seems, uh, once again, it may be nothing. Um... Sheree says because they had been married for over 25 years, he had a training for that weekend and the daughters were on a tamping trip returning home on mother's day. Well, once again, Sheree, if the mothers, if the daughter's returning that day, I'm surprised the mother just didn't wait around for them to get home. I don't know. No, I didn't see that. Sheree, I'm sure you're correct. I'm sure you're 100%. You know, if that is what I just didn't see that anywhere. Cherie says, I was alone on Mother's Day also. I didn't, you know, want to think of, make you think of that, Cherie. But, um, okay. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's something. But I know that they've tried to make sure, you know, was the husband where he said he was at that time? I don't know if they've absolutely 100% did this, but it is, uh, uh, a um a year uh, a week and a half later, I think that they would be able to do that. What's unclear to me though is what actually caused if she was uh, being the tree. You seem to know a little bit about this. What confuses me then is it sounds to me like somebody saw her right away. Then why did the neighbor sound the alarm that's that she was missing? Did the neighbor go over? And see that she wasn't home when she was supposed to be. Um, did he try, did the neighbor man or woman try calling her and she didn't pick up? Like it went straight to voicemail. Uh, it's, it's unclear to me why this uh, neighbor, uh, you know, said, oh, something's wrong. You've got to get people involved. She, she's missing. I mean, how would he or she know how long Suzanne had been out riding her bike? How would they know that anything was wrong at all? Uh, that's something that's not clear to me. Once again, reading the articles that I could find, it's just not clear to me. I'd want to know uh, about her bike riding. Did she always go on Sundays at the same time, the same pattern, the same direction? Uh, that would be helpful. Um, just some things here that I, I, once again, it just doesn't seem that we have enough information. And in, in fact, um, uh, Sharice is calling and couldn't get a hold of her. So the daughters, uh, alerted. So the daughters, so what you're saying is Sharice is the daughters got home. She wasn't there. 
They tried to call their mother, couldn't reach her, and then they told they alerted the neighbor. It's weird. Two teenage daughters uh, tell the neighbor, alert the neighbor. Okay. It was before they got home. They were trying to reach her and couldn't reach her. So the neighbor, oh, I see what you're saying, Sheree. Neighbor, uh, daughters were maybe coming home, trying to reach their mother. They couldn't reach her. The neighbor goes over there and uh, the neighbor and uh, the mother's not home. Okay. Still, I don't know. Uh, Sheree says, I don't think she went on the bike ride personally. So you're thinking somebody made it look like she went on a bike ride. Yeah, I uh, I have to tell you, Sheree, I like that idea a lot. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if somebody went into the house, I mean, let's say it was a break-in. She's there by herself. Somebody breaks in, takes her out. I mean, somebody's actually said, oh, I'm going to make it look like she went on a bike ride. Okay. I don't know. That seems like a lot of work. But... Uh, the problem we have is that somebody said she did go on a bike ride. Somebody says they, you know, he or she did see Suzanne ride the bike away from her house. So I, I don't know. I think if we knew where the bike was found, that might help us. And it still doesn't make a lot of sense to me that two teenage daughters get home, uh, you know, can't reach their mother and they alert the neighbor. I mean, if they're teenagers, they surely can call 911 all by themselves. Um, Paula says, seems like they overreacted to her not being home. Maybe. Renee, well, the bike and the personal item were not found in the same spot. Yeah, and we don't know what that personal item is yet, do we, Renee? So... I don't, I don't, I don't know what to think. I, I have a much better feeling for Madison's disappearance than I do for Suzanne's. Uh, I could be like Cherie and believe she didn't go on a bike ride at all. And somebody made it just look that way, but that seems like a lot of work. On the other hand, she might've gone on a bike ride and somebody attacked her. That does happen. Uh, women runners do get attacked. Uh, so it does happen. So it's just, but I think a lot of people are, how weird is it that it happened when her husband was out of town and her daughters were away wherever they were? I agree. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just put this out there. Maybe Suzanne had another man. How about that? Um, the Doe Patrol says her theory, the Doe Patrol's theory is that the husband killed her and took her remains up to the mountains. He was a he was serious hunter and black bear killer. Camping the girls, good cover him for him to do so. Girls went to neighbor when they got to house. Well, unless somebody can break his alibi, I don't know uh, how much we can buy into that. Um, and it doesn't seem like that's been done a, a week and a half yet later. A week and a half later, I suppose it's possible. Uh, the nephew said the bike was found, but couldn't talk about the condition. However, Ellie's hasn't said anything. Uh, any new developments in the case of the woman who disappeared right before she was supposed to host a Super Bowl party? Uh, Indy, that's a good question. I don't think so. I think that's still a, a missing one. I will look that up. Thank you for reminding me. I remember we did talk about that one a while ago, I guess back when the Super Bowl happened. Uh, Sheree says, I know the husband got an attorney, a criminal defense attorney. Huh. Okay. Kristen says, Oh my God, my boys are on, on their, in their twenties and they would call nine one one immediately. Okay. Just depends on how kids were brought up, I guess. Uh, eh, the dope patrol had, it's a cabin in the woods where they live a big cabin, like a state. The bike was staged. They have said, well, I, unless I don't know how they would know it was staged unless they saw somebody else put it there, but maybe, um, it just, uh, Doe Patrol, it does seem maybe you have a little more information than the public has, but, um, I don't know. 
Renee says, he said, call the sheriff, ask about the condition that's in her. No one has heard from her since the family left also. So what you're saying is, Doe Patrol, is that even though somebody is saying that they saw her drive off, ride off on a bike on Sunday, what you're saying is that nobody had contact with her after her husband and daughters left, I don't know, Friday or Saturday? Once again, maybe Suzanne had another man. We'll keep tabs on it, and if we hear anything that I can talk about, I will let you know. Um, like I said, there are some things about Madison Bell's disappearance that I know about. I just can't talk about it. I, I'm sworn to secrecy, um, but I feel what I explained to you uh, is a very likely scenario. Um, helmet. Okay, the Doe Patrol. All right, let's talk about this Friday's episode. This episode took a while to put together. Uh, I started talking to the guest, John Paulos, way back in early 2017. And he is an expert on the disappearance of Julie Wefflin. Why? Because he worked with her back in the 1980s. They worked for the same power company in the state of Washington. And she went missing on September 16th, 1987. She um, was on her way home for work. She, from work, she volunteered to stop at a stub, substation because there was something going on there. That was her job. She said, no problem. I'll get it on the way home. She will. She stopped into this substation, never made it home. When her husband, who was working 50 miles away that day, said, hey, you know, he called uh, the power company to find out, Hey, you know, my wife didn't get home yet. And they told him, well, she was supposed to stop at this substation and we don't know what happened. So they went out there and they found Julie's vehicle. They found her tools scattered all over the ground. They found her helmet, like power company people wear on the ground as well. And there was obvious signs of a struggle and it looked like Julie had been abducted. And there was no movement on the case on that disappearance from then until John Polos, who once again was working for the power company at the time, he got involved starting sometime in 2010. I think that's when he made the decision, but really didn't get things rolling till 2011. He got motivated. He got together with some other former uh, power company employees and they started working on. Julie's disappearance because nobody else at that time was working on it. And very quickly, they, they established a possible suspect. His name, and this will be the first time uh, that will be uh, one of the first times this name will be mentioned um, on the internet. His name is Will Parks. And they were, to, they were able to establish that Will Parks and Julie Wefflin knew each other. They've also been able to establish that Will and Julie were in some sort of, out, I know the name of the group, but I can't say it, uh, some outdoors group in the Spokane, Washington area. And Will was harassing Julie, and she got him kicked out of the group. They were also able to, to establish that Will Parks lives within just a few miles of where Julie disappeared from. So the main concentration this Friday will be on the disappearance of Julie Wefflin, but that's not where it ends. In the process of doing this investigation into what happened to Julie, another woman who went missing in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is across the river from Spokane, her name came up. Her name, Deborah Swanson. She went missing on March 29th, 1986. Well, guess what? John and his group had been able to establish that she knew Will Parks as well. And in fact, she was at a party the night before she disappeared. She disappeared once again, in Coeur d'Alene in a park, um, she allegedly drove to this park to go running, very much like Suzanne uh, Morfu and her going biking. 
Uh, Deborah went to this park for a run and later she disappeared and her car was still parked in the parking lot for that park. Never seen again. Well, the night before she went on this run, she was at a party and guess what? Will Parks was there as well. Uh, John and myself, although it hasn't been recently, I talked to Deborah Swanson's sister way back in 2017. She verified that Deborah did know Will Parks and that Will Parks was interested in Deborah Swanson, but she wasn't interested in him. So what are the odds the two women who don't know each other. We've ne they've never established that John and his group have not established that Julie and Deborah know each other, but two women who don't know each other go missing. And they just happen to know the same guy. And both of them had problems with him. And you will hear John talk about this, uh, during the interview that I did with him. The reason we were able to finally do this, uh, interview is because Will Parks, he himself, uh, had sort of a surly reputation. And uh, not the thing is, though, he was a business owner and had an, uh, a successful business called Adventure Dynamics, where groups of people would go and they would to do team building activities like do zip lining and all sorts of different things on this property that he owned not far from where Julie disappeared. And he was living there from 1987. Well, he died earlier this year. And John had told me that, you know, he would not come on the program if there was any threat that he could get from Will Parks because Will Parks was allegedly a scary guy. Well, Will Parks died in January uh, at the age of 68. He had gone to get something to eat somewhere and he was eating it while driving. And seemingly he choked on something, crashed his car and died. Maybe he had a heart attack or something. I'm not sure, but he is now deceased. Will Parks. Well, as soon as I found that out, I called John up and we did the interview uh, that you will hear this Friday. Now there's one more woman that you will hear about on Friday and her name is Catherine Ray, R A H E Gregory. And she disappeared from Spokane in 1981. So Julie disappeared in 87, Deborah in 86. Well, Catherine disappeared five years before either of these two women, other women did. And what makes John, you'll hear John talk about it, but she also might have been a victim of Will Parks because she kind of looks like Julie Wefflin, they're all in the kind of the same sage, same age group. They're all professionals. And what I was able to establish was that, uh, will lived within a couple blocks of where Catherine disappeared in 1981. So that's going to be the episode. You'll, you'll hear me in the introduction only talk about Julie, but eventually in the interview with John Polos, we will talk about Deborah and Catherine as well. And it'll be up to you when we're all done to figure out does Will Parks make a good suspect in these disappearances or were all these disappearances committed by different men? I mean, surely Julie was abducted. Maybe Deborah ran off. The park is next to a body of water. Maybe she committed suicide by jumping into the water or something. Catherine, she disappeared in downtown Spokane, Washington. Broad daylight. She had come out of some, I think she was a nurse. She had some nursing class. She disappeared after leaving that class. Her car was found in Spokane, in downtown Spokane, as if she never made it back to it. So. The name of this episode is one that I particularly like. And the name of the episode is The Women's Reject. Because if we're to believe that Will Parks committed these disappearances, it seems pretty clear to me that the reason he did it is because he made advances on these women and they didn't want to have anything to do with them. So they rejected them. 
So the name of the episode is The Women's Reject. This is a play off that movie, that horror movie by Rob Zombie, The Devil's Rejects. So this is one uh, that we've been working on for a while, and it's finally, finally, finally uh, uh, very gratifying to be able to bring uh, these three disappearances to all of you. Uh, I've been very patient. And I have to, I'm, I'm sad on one hand that if Will Parks did commit these disappearances, that he's not going to get the answer for them here in the material world. But on the other hand, it is really nice to be able to now talk about them being that he's gone and John uh, wanted to come on the program. So Kristen says, please email Ed. Yeah, Kristen, I will take care of you with the books. Don't worry about that. Uh, we will figure it out for Kristen. No problem with that. Uh, Jasmine says, looking forward to hearing these cases will be the same per will, with the same person of interest. Uh, I think there's a decent chance, but once again, it's up to the audience to determine that. Uh, Carrie says, Hmm, another Dennis Bowman. Maybe I bet there are more than those in five years, just not connected yet. Yeah. I could make an episode with that same name. I could make an episode with that same with that same name. Uh, the women's reject. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. I don't know what that means, Sherry, but Sherry, but I'm sure you could. So that is the episode for this Friday. And the other thing that you're going to get out with from John is that he's not a professional investigator. He's not a private investigator. He's just your average guy used to be an engineer for that electrical company. He's in his late seventies and he's working on this disappearance, these disappearances. And you're going to get to see his step-by-step -step process. And I think it's a good one for anyone to follow any person to follow who is interested in starting their own investigation into disappearance. I think John is doing very good work. Very, very, very good work. Although I will say that there's still a lot of holes to fill in the puzzle uh, to really make it 100% that uh, Will Parks is responsible for these disappearances. But surely um, John has done nice work over the last nine to 10 years. So let's see what we did tonight. An hour and 45 minutes again. Crazy. Um, the, uh, the Daniel Sleeper poll, Andrea Bowman, the new program this, uh, this Sunday, Unfound on the Ground, hosted by Dr. Eric Grabowski for premium Patreon members. It will be done through Zoom at 8 p.m. Eastern. T-shirts being done by Heather. We talked about Dal Phillips. Could there be sightings of him? We talked about Cameron Repper. Remmer is the picture that was taken of that guy in San Francisco. Is that Cameron? We talk about, talked about Natasha's podcasts. We talked about Madison Bell. We talked about Suzanne Morphew, and I previewed this Friday's disappearances, plural. Julie Wefflin, Deborah Swanson, and Catherine Ray Gregory, an episode I'm calling the Women's Reject. That's it. Good night, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Had a ton of viewers tonight. Wow, that's spectacular. Thank you all for watching. I hope you were entertained. Once again, this show a little more laid back. Then the think tank, more laid back in the episode, so I don't mind calling it uh, a show. And in this kind of a vein, I am at least trying to entertain you at least a little bit along with uh, giving you some information and answering questions. So thank you all for joining in tonight. Really enjoyed it. As always, you will hear me Friday. Good night. <laughs>